Buenas hello and welcome back to our Hummingbird ID series. Hummingbirds are without a doubt crowd favorites. Whether it's their tiny size, their unique behavior, or their iridescent plumage, these birds are truly fascinating. In this series, we get to meet all the hummingbirds you can reasonably expect to see on your visit to this birdie country, with tips on where to find them and how to identify them. In part one, we already introduced some of the more obvious hummingbirds in Costa Rica, the hermits and the violet saberwing. Going forward, we're changing the approach slightly and group the hummingbirds by where they occur. Now, this isn't a perfect grouping of hummingbirds, as some of them do occur in multiple habitats and areas, but we'll point that out when we get there. In today's part two, we will meet the hummingbirds of the dry North Pacific lowlands and foothills. Costa Rica's North Pacific isn't exactly a hotbed for bird diversity, but of course there are still hummingbirds around, even some regional specialties. The good news is that few areas here are better than others, and birding in gardens or at forest edges can turn up most of these species. So let's dive in. There are nine species of hummingbirds commonly encountered in this area of the country. These are the rufous-tailed hummingbird, the cinnamon hummingbird, the scaly-breasted hummingbird, canavids emerald, the blue-vented hummingbird, the blue-throated golden tail, the green-breasted mango, the ruby-throated hummingbird, and the plain-capped starthroat. The rufous-tailed hummingbird is by far the most common and widespread hummingbird in Costa Rica. Its success might be due to it actually benefiting from human altering of habitats. It mainly inhibits gardens, clearings, and forest edge zones where it is very territorial around food sources and can often be seen chasing other hummingbirds and large insects. Apart from the characteristic rufous tail with a very narrow dark end, the bird is green with dark wings. Its reddish bill is slightly decurved with a black tip. If you're anywhere in the country and not too high up in the mountains, chances aren't bad that this is the first hummingbird you'll spot. The cinnamon hummingbird, in contrast, can only be found in the northwest of the country and in the western parts of the Central Valley. If you just see it from behind, it's pretty similar to the rufous-tailed hummingbird, with a green back, dark wings, and a reddish tail. However, its underparts are entirely cinnamon orange. It's a frequent garden visitor, but far less aggressive than its rufous-tailed cousin. Another bird that can, in the wrong conditions, somewhat resemble the rufous-tailed hummingbird is the blue-throated golden tail. However, this beautiful hummingbird has a thick, straight, bright red bill, and its tail is greenish gold, rather than rufous. The male has an iridescent violet throat. These hummingbirds can often be found by following their constant singing in mid-levels of forest clearings and edge zones. They also visit gardens. The blue-throated golden tail is fairly common in the Pacific lowlands and foothills, but they do also occur in similar habitats on the Caribbean slope. Continuing with common garden visitors in the North Pacific, Canavet's emerald is noticeably smaller than the previous birds, which weren't very big to begin with. It's quite common in the far northwest and a little less so on the Nicoya Peninsula and in the western central valley. The male is mostly dark and might pose some ID challenges, but its entirely green back and its dark forked tail are distinctive. The female is easier to identify, with green upperparts but pale grey underparts, a black mask and a thick white stripe behind the eye. The blue vented hummingbird is the reason the male Canavids emerald might pose some challenges. Its overall color pattern is very similar, but it lacks the forked tail. Instead, its straight steely blue tail is separated from the green back by its coppery rump. It has a dark patch on the wings. Keep that in mind. Males and females look alike. The blue vented hummingbird's range overlaps with the Canavids emerald, but extends into the northern Caribbean slope, further east into the Central Valley, and even into the Dota region. There is another very similar hummingbird that I didn't even mention in the overview. The blue-tailed hummingbird. The reason for this omission is simple. It's a very rare migrant, and quite a few of the previous documentations may actually have been blue-vented hummingbirds. If you do chance upon a hummingbird that looks like a blue-vented hummingbird, but shows a rufous patch on its wings, please take a picture. 
The next bird on our list, the scaly breasted hummingbird, is often described with the words drab or dull. While that may not sound very kind, you can sort of see where the descriptions come from. In fact, drab hummingbird might be even a better name, because as you can see, the breast isn't really all that scaly. The scaly breasted hummingbird is quite a bit larger than the previous hummers we've seen, and while it may be a little dull in its plumage, it does have some diagnostic features. The white spot behind the eye and the large white patches on the outer tail feathers are distinctive. And what it lacks in color, it makes up in its song. For a hummingbird, this is quite impressive. The scaly-breasted hummingbird occurs in dry and humid habitats along the Pacific coast, but also in the Caño Negro region and all the way into the Sarapiquí area. Similarly sized is the plain-capped starthroat, but size is just about the only thing these birds have in common. The plain-capped starthroat has a very long straight bill and a distinctive facial pattern with a dark eye mask. Its characteristic throat is red, but can sometimes be hard to see. It has a white belly and green tail feathers with white tips. Males and females look alike. The plain-capped starthroat likes to forage in mid to high levels of second growth forests. Although it does come to edge zones and sometimes even to more isolated flowering trees in fields. Next up, the green-breasted mango. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Tim, why is this thing called a mango? It's not particularly mango-esque. There's a whole family of hummingbirds called mangoes, and in fact these birds have nothing to do with the fruit at all, as mango trees are originally from southern Asia, and while they were of course introduced to the new world, the mango hummingbirds had somehow gotten their names before the fruits were common here. The name mango is not derived from Spanish or Portuguese or any indigenous language either, and unlike say the motmots or the cuckoos, mango hummingbirds don't call out their names. So what is it then? Well, it's a weird story. This is Sir Hans Sloan, first baronet, whatever that means, physician, naturalist, supposed inventor of chocolate milk and avid collector. And by avid, I mean avid. After his death, his collection was left to the nation of Britain and eventually laid the foundation for the British Museum. That was the good stuff. The weird stuff he just gave away to his loyal traveling servant, James Salter. At the time, Salter owned a barber shop in Chelsea, but I imagine upon seeing his newfound treasure, converted it into a coffee house and a curiosity cabinet. James Salter was now Don Saltero. The coffee house was a big hit, frequented by, among others, Sir Isaac Newton, and in 1736, Eleazar Albin, who at the time was working on his book, A Natural History of Birds. Albin drew and described known species at the time, and for at least a couple of them, he used Don Saltero's exhibits. One of them, you guessed it, was a Jamaican hummingbird. Also on display at Don Salteros? An Indian oriole, known at the time as mango bird. Apparently Albin's notes weren't the cleanest and the mix-up happened. And when Carl Linnaeus used Albin's work for his monumental Sistema Nature, the name stuck. Anyway, sorry for going off tangent there. The green-breasted mango. With its maroon tail, the male might at first glance be confused with the rufous-tailed hummingbird but it is larger, has a slightly curved bill and a blue-black stripe down the center of its throat and chest. The female is even more unique. It still has the dark strip, but the rest of its underparts are whitish, giving a very obvious contrast. The best place to see this bird might just be the wetlands of Caño Negro and Palo Verde, but it does also occur, though less regularly, in other areas of the North Pacific, Caribbean lowlands, the Central Pacific and even the Central Valley. If you find a bird that looks like this in the far southern Pacific lowlands close to the Panamanian border, take a picture you might have stumbled across a rare Veraguan mango, a very similar bird that's been extending its range up from Panama in recent years. Our final species for today is the famous ruby-throated hummingbird. The gorgeous male is unmistakable in Costa Rica, with its red throat and a forked black tail. The female looks similar, but lacks the red throat. It is best identified by the white spot behind the eye and the white outer edges on the forked tail. The ruby-throated hummingbird is unique among Costa Rican hummingbirds. It's a migrant. Every April, ruby-throated hummingbirds leave their wintering areas in Central America for the eastern US and Canada, where they breed. While most seem to hug the coast on their way there, some fearless ones cross the Gulf of Mexico, 500 miles over water in a single non-stop flight. Given their size and their metabolism, this might just be one of the most remarkable migrations in the animal kingdom. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Also, apologies for not uploading as regularly over the past few weeks. Um, Everything is fine. Just a lot of stuff going on right now. I'll be better. I promise. So, see you soon. And as always, happy burning. <laughs> Ciao.